So thank you very much. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me and I take it as mostly these sessions help me more than anybody else. So uh, in that sense, it's a revision for me. Uh, having said that, I definitely want to congratulate all of you for having completed your six chapters of Bhagavad Gita in much detail. And I also uh, wish you the best for uh, the remaining chapters, a good study of all the other chapters to come. Uh, so I have been asked to revise the first six chapters. And uh, the way I have planned is I have a small PPT just to support me more than anything else. Uh, where we will uh, have one slide which will uh, have some pictures and where it's kind of, um, you know, making you involve into the uh, uh, understanding of the chapter. So we will try and um, look at the pictures and see whether you, whether you can identify some of the concepts that you have already uh, studied. Then there will be a, chap a slide which will uh, list the important topics of uh, the chapter and then for each chapter let's look at one um, salient feature one very important concept that's been discussed in that chapter yes every chapter has one many many important points but one highlight so we'll try and discuss that one point so this is the way i have planned let's see how it goes because there are six chapters second chapter is so long so let's see how it goes i'll try my best but uh, if there are any questions or any comments in between, please feel free. You can also keep your questions towards the end. I'm okay with that also. So let me start uh, sharing my screen. But if, if anybody had something to say right now, also please, uh, you can do that. Uh, I'll just go to my book. Like I said, it's a it's a very basic PPT just to help me more than anybody else. All right. So here we are, summary of Bhagavad Gita. Now so let's look at the very first chapter. Oh, let me let me pray. I have uh, done the kirtan, but let me let me recite my invocation prayers uh, before we go on to discuss Bhagavad Gita. Om Adhyana Timirandasya. Yananjana Shalakaya, Chakshur Unmilitam Yena, the Smai Shri Guravena, Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam, Stapitam Yena Bhutale, Swayam Rupa Kadamahim, the Dati Swapadantikam, Mandeham, Shri Guru, Shri Utapadakamalam, Shri Guru Vaishnamamscha, Shri Rupam Sagrajatam, Sagana Ragunathan Vitam Tham Sajivam, Sadvaitam, Savadhutam, Parishana Sahitam, Krishna Chaitanya Devam, Shri Radha Krishna Padan, Sahagana Lalita, Shri Vishakhan Vitamscha, He Krishna Karuna Sindhu, Dina Bandho Jagatpati, Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate, Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi, Sri Radhe Vrindavaneshwari, Vrishabhano Sute Devi, Pranamami Haripriya, Vancha Kalpaturubhesha, Kripas in Dubha Evacha, Patitanam, Pavanebhu, Vaishnavebhu, Namo Namaha, Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shiva Sadi, Gaurabhakta Prinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Ajana Lambita Bujau, Kanakava Datau, Sankirta Naika Pitarau, Kamalaya Dakshau, Vishwam Bharau, Chavarau, Vadharma Palau, Vandeja Gatpiakarau, Karunavatarau. Yunta Pravisham Mamavacha Mimam Prasuptam, Sanjeeva Yatakila Shakti Dharaswadhamna, Anyam Shahasta Charana Shavana Tugadi, Pranan Namo Bhagavate Purushaya Tibhyam. Uh, Matas, looks like the audio is very low. Is that uh, for everybody or? No, I am able. To, I am able to hear her clearly, but I, I just want to check with others. It's audible, but uh, not as audible as others. Maybe yeah. I should. I should uh... Speak a little, little louder or something. Little closure of uh, that's my key. Sure, sure. If you have headphones, then you can be able. Okay, now maybe uh, it's okay. It's better, yes. Okay. Yeah, it's clear. Yeah. 
All right. Okay, so looking at this particular slide, which is the very first chapter, can we identify any three things that we can see on this slide? Any three things, please note. And uh, you may unmute yourself and uh, tell me what are the three things that you want to uh, point out about this slide. Arjuna is on the flag. Yeah, Arjuna do not want to fight and want to see. Okay, one, 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 one person, one uh, that will be good, so that everybody gets a chance. Okay, Sajid, I, I think so. It, it will be better if you call out names. I should call out names. Yeah, that will be better so that everyone gets the opportunity, right? And then okay. everyone participates. Yeah. Because you know they're not children. I don't know whether they would like it that way. Oh no, that's fine because like we go serial wise. That's fine. Nice. All right. Okay, so Shan Prabhu, you you were saying something. Uh, I, uh... I'm not yet started. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you haven't so, started. Rajesh Prabhu, yes. Rajesh Prabhu, Rajesh Prabhu said, yes, Rajesh. Yeah, what I'm saying is uh, Hanuma is on the flag okay. of chariot. Okay. Very nice. So that is a sign of victory and uh, the battle is happening in Kurukshetra. Excellent. So, oh, enough, 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 enough. Yes, so first one was the sign of victory is Hanumanji on the flag uh, of this chariot. Excellent point. And that's covered in the first chapter. Yes, anybody else wants to... Compassionate uh, Lord Sri Krishna took yeah. the role of the chariot of his devotee and friend Arjuna. Very nice. Bhakta Vatsala, compassionate Krishna, who's taken the role of charioteer. Very nice. Then what else? Anybody else? Uh, Santosh Raghuri Yeah, uh, uh, Arjuna do not want to kill his family persons and uh, he is not willing to fight and surrender in his bow. Perfect, perfect. Arjuna doesn't want to fight at all on this battlefield. Uh, now, yeah, so we have come, we have finished the three points, but uh, of course, uh, one of the points is also that um, Krishna is Bhaktavatsala, Krishna is also uh, instructing something to Arjuna here, or Arjuna is not willing to fight. But we have the first chapter describing the scene of the battlefield, isn't it? That's a big chunk of the chapter describes how the battlefield is arranged. And uh, many of us, we tend to believe or we tend to feel that there's not much philosophy in chapter one, since it's talking mostly about how uh, the battlefield uh, is arranged, A, and B, how Arjuna begins to, um, you know, get into a shock and despair and says, I do not want to fight. But... Uh, there is more to the chapter than uh, just what we see in terms of uh, these three points that you all have mentioned. Yes, preparing for the war, signs of victory, and Arjuna's doubts. These are the main contents of this particular chapter. But there is a very important salient feature, like I mentioned, every chapter will have one highlight. And that is uh, this. How to approach a guru is much mentioned in the first chapter. Let's try to uh, analyze this very quickly. So this chapter, of course, begins also with a very philosophical question by uh, Dhritarashtra. Not obviously philosophical because he just says, Dharma kshetre, Kuru kshetre, Samaveta, Yuyutsavaha, Mamakaha, Pandavashchaiva, Kimakurvata Sanchaya. He's just saying that those uh, uh, who are desirous of fighting, who, my sons and the sons of Pandu, what did they do after coming to the battlefield of Kurukshetra? So it feels like almost asking a question. Uh, all those people who were so hungry and went to the restaurant, what did they do? Right? Obviously, they eat. So ones who are desirous of fighting, why did they go to the battlefield? What did they do? Obviously means that they went to fight, but what kind of a strange question is Dhritarashtra asking? So here uh, in the purport, is, it, it's explained uh, how Dhritarashtra is actually expressing his fear. His fear of the power of Dham, of Kurukshetra, which is a Dham. So he's really scared that in this place, perhaps, uh, his children are going to be influenced uh, in a not so uh, positive manner, yes, in a, in a way which is not going to be positive for them. So he's, he's afraid of that, expressing his doubt. Then on, Sanjaya, who's his assistant, uh, who is having a live telecast of the entire battlefield, he's reporting to Dhritarashtra what happens. And the very first thing that he says is that uh, I can see Duryodhana approach his teacher, who is he? Dronacharya. 
and how does he approach him he approaches him with a kind of contempt and sarcasm he says look here he is telling his own teacher look how your disciple intelligent disciple has arranged uh, the army so he is pointing out to drishtadyumna who is dronacharya's son you all have heard all this yes who is who is uh, wow, who is who is destined to kill dronacharya uh, drupada's son i'm so sorry drishtadyumna who is drupada's son so why is duryodhana telling this to dronacharya in a in a mood of sarcasm that uh, you think you're very intelligent by training your own disciple to kill you what kind of an uh, you know what kind of an arrangement is this what have you done you better fight but then on the other side when we look at arjuna now he also goes to his teacher and what does he do he also asks him to take him to the middle of the battlefield and he also instructs him he also says okay now and then what happens once he goes to the middle of the battlefield arjuna is in complete despair which we many of us can relate to so often we get into that complete despair helplessness state where arjuna he starts literally shivering he just gives it up he says gandivam samsrate hastat pakchayiva paridahyate nacha shaknomya vasthatum brahmati vacha me manaha he is he is so much in anxiety his hands are shivering and he says gandivam samsrate hastat my gandiva is slipping away from my hand he is uh, in this kind of an anxiety but krishna hasn't said anything to him yet so same like what dronacharya also doesn't say anything to duryodhana now uh, arjuna goes on to kind of instruct krishna in a way telling him what is right what is wrong he says adharma bhibhavat krishna he is telling that this is adharma this is this is not right i how can i fight uh, i'm going to kill all these people and and there will be so many widows and this is adharma and then he goes on to so he is preaching he is telling krishna what is to be done what is not to be done he says i have heard bhavati tenu shushruma he says i have heard so he is even quoting from where he has heard all that he has heard about what happens if you engage in uh, killing all these people he says nareki anyatam vasu they will all stay in hell krishna what are you what are you saying why should i fight so both of them seem to i mean duryodhana doesn't give a bad good example at all but arjuna doesn't seem to be any better is there any difference between the two does anybody want to say can you see any difference between duryodhana and i think arjuna is so compassionate and he looks to be an elevated soul spiritually and due to yoga maya he just felt that uh, you know um, all these relatives and friends and family these people will be killed but he is very compassionate and he is a elevated soul okay. and he is putting all the questions i think there is no sarcasm at all in, in the way ah, he is approaching the last point what you said makes a yes. lot of sense that he didn't have any sarcasm he didn't have any offensive attitude as duryodhana had so the difference between the two is only this much that arjuna also was instructing his teacher but he didn't have an offensive mentality he was not proud as duryodhana was he was really uh, in a sense of you know confusion doesn't want to fight he's telling everything but he didn't have a sense of right and that is what makes arjuna different and that is what made krishna speak the bhagavad gita to arjuna so bhagavad gita before we all move on to discuss the other chapters very important is the kind of attitude that we have towards bhagavad gita what do we want to hear mahatma gandhi read the bhagavad gita and said non violence yes when there is there is war here so similarly you know different people will have different uh, motives from the bhagavad gita and that's not the spirit of bhagavad gita this is precisely uh, what we are learning in the first chapter yes when when arjuna he completely gives up like this na yotsya iti govinda he just says i am not going to fight in the second chapter begins with that sanjaya reporting uh, that uh, arjuna said he will not fight and he threw away his gandiva right 
at this point krishna lifts him up and how with scolding that's uh, again a very instructive point yeah he begins with what he says utastu akashmalam idam says that it from where these impurities have got into your heart get up is literally you're shaking him up he says get up what's wrong with you you're talking as if you know a lot of things pragya vadams cha bhasha se he says you 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 sound to be as if you're very very intelligent so arjuna when when krishna scolds him because he doesn't have pride that's the most important quality he doesn't have pride which is why when krishna scolds him what happens his steam goes down the all that you know that he was saying in in despair or in all confusion that goes down the moment he is scolded and that's where the second chapter begins and after krishna scolds him a few verses let's uh, uh, we will go to that second chapter now but let's look at these pictures again and let's see what the second chapter is talking about let's start just random concepts are put here this and the next slide because the second chapter is really long so what all uh, is there in the second chapter dehinosmin yeah absolutely dehinosmin is there yada dehe komar yavanam jara tada dehanta prapti teras tatran mohit nice correct so krishna says that what else is there you may not be able to guess with some of the yeah so arjuna arjuna surrender to krishna and accept him as a guru uh, that's also there yes what do you think this particular picture in middle is trying to say anything that comes oh, sam jigna <laughs> no 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 uh, well not giving up any clothes then surrendering <laughs> surrendering duty does it get you a sense yeah. of duty yeah which is what krishna is asking arjuna to do and this picture below vyavsay atmik yeah very nice very nice would others also want to contribute <laughs> all right yeah that's also about intelligence that uh, krishna is saying correct now there is one more what else what about this controlling the senses controlling your senses like the dot is here draws its lens yes and then uh, this is very obvious here which is the word krodat bhavati samoha samoha smriti brahma yes smriti brahma sa buddhi na sa buddhi na sat pranashyati ashadi very nice nice and finally this ocean apurvamana achalam correct that's the last words of uh, uh, the last concept of the second chapter right okay so there we are uh, these are the different different concepts that are explained here so let's go back to where we were why krishna starts when krishna scolded arjuna arjuna again uh, speaks but now his team has reduced he only says he starts giving uh, he starts defending his his position yes he says uh, uh, says how how can i fight how can i kill my own grandparents how can i kill my own relatives uh, it, it seems to be very unfair krishna this that so it's now the the steam has gone down but he's still defending till he's still the, the justifying his weakness the moment he accepts his weakness yes krishna starts instructing the bhagavad gita what does he accept he says karpanya dosho bhata swaha yes all of you so he accepts his weakness and he says now i am shishyasteham shadi mam tvam prapantam where he says now accept me as your student shishya uh, but the what he says he still is not ready to fight he says still he says na yodse but i am not going to fight i am i am your disciple all right but i am not ready to fight again an important uh, idea for us is that uh, you know we, we we surrender to guru to krishna maybe but our surrender is not complete yes we still have a lot of reservations we still keep holding on to that rope yeah scared that what happens if i leave that rope that's still there so krishna is asking uh, krishna is not expecting that surrender yet 
now he starts speaking the bhagavad gita and it's only after the 18 chapters that arjuna finally will say nashtamoha smritir lakta that is when he is actually going to get back his uh, intelligence right so this chapter uh, uh, you know it begins with the description of the soul right when arjuna is so perplexed it's so nice to see what krishna says the very first verse to reduce his perplexity he says natve vaham jatuna sam natvam ne me janati va so beautiful verse he says like you know a child says i'm very afraid of writing this exam i don't want to go to exam and the parent says there's no exam this don't have an exam only how nice immediately the child is cool down is like so arjuna when he saying i don't want to fight i don't want to fight i don't want to kill he says you're not killing they're not going to die at all immediately he responds by saying but they're all going to stay forever they've always lived they are living everybody here and they will continue to live so this verse is a very nice beginning to for arjuna to actually open up his ears and begin to hear the bhagavad gita now krishna is uh, uh, is going to talk all about the soul in the next few verses uh, describing its its eternal indestructible nature yes we have heard so many verses here does somebody want to uh, mention one of the verses describing the quality of the soul vasam chijino nida vihaya navan gritnati naro parani tadha sarirani vihaya jinani anyani samyati navan very nice any other verse नैनम चिंदन्ति सस्त्राणि नैनम दहदि पावकः न चैनम क्लादयम् यापो न सोषेषु मात्र या दिस इज सच अ नाइस वर्स व्हिच इज टेलिंग हाउ द सोल इज नेवर इन दिस इज इट कैन नॉट बी डिस्ट्रॉयड एट ऑल इट कैन नॉट बी इवन यू नो कट बाय एनी वेपन्स और बर्न्ड बाय फायर लाइक वेट मॉइस्टेंड बाय वाटर और विदर्ड बाय विंड नथिंग हैपेंस टू द सोल नैनम चिंदन्ति सस्त्राणि सो इन दिस वे कृष्णा गोस ऑन टॉकिंग अबाउट this ashcharyavat concept isn't it ashcharyavat it is so it is so wonderful goes on describing about the soul this is ashcharyavat this is so wonderful it it nothing happens to the soul nothing nothing uh, it's always eternal you would not be able to kill it nobody is no, you can't slay you can't you can't be slain yourself you can't slay anybody else so all this wonderful concept ashcharyavat concept krishna goes on describing for a very long time and in the process he is also going to distinguish between the body and the soul yes a very clear distinction he is making he, he tells what is the soul uh, eternal and immediately he says the body is temporary so he keeps giving a parallel he says yeah you are not killing anybody what you are killing immediate words that comes after uh the first one is the hero as well like what you said says yeah you're not killing anybody but this soul that's there is just passing from one body to the other just as it's passing from one stage of life or one stage of the body to other it's going to pass into another body at death after death so there's nothing for you to worry he introduces this concept of this distinction not that you're not going to kill anybody you're going to kill the body but the body is that's fine it's anyway temporary and then he talks the next verse which is very very crucial on uh, tolerance yes he brings about after the hinoasmin immediately he talks about matra sparshas tu kamteya shetoshna sukha dukkhada all of us know this verse agama paino yes tam stitikshasva titikshasva is as tolerate and this is a very important idea he says how you just have to understand your identity by distinguishing the two he is bringing out the science of identity here very clearly in this chapter yeah who are you so we all have two fun- two identities one is uh, at the level of our functional identity and the other is the original identity yes the functional identity as a mother or i'm a teacher or a sister i'm a, all that that is my functional identity in that function i need to perform certain functions role and the other identity which is my original identity that is of the the spirit soul that krishna described ashcharya vat concept yes and one has to perform or understand the functional identity keeping this original identity always as the basis this is what krishna is trying to tell us 
and then in that mode we can perform our duty and uh, i i told right in the beginning this the second chapter is a complete summary so all of these points are elaborately described in other chapters to come right so then uh, what's happening here krishna is telling that perform your duty by rising above the three modes and, and there's much to be discussed about the three modes uh, in the 14th chapter but to very simply put it that don't be influenced by uh, these three modes the sattva rajas and tamas which will have some kind of a reaction good or bad yeah, don't 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 do your duty with that uh, mood in that uh, uh, framework however perform your duty without expectations and how is that possible to perform your duty without expectations is when you have this one pointed intelligence this is how krishna goes on to say that if you have to do this then you will have to develop something called as a spiritual intelligence so he is now talking about two kinds of intelligence he says very clearly one form of intelligence is which uh, you know kind of always supports your mind that says you're the best yes the intelligence say yeah i'll give you 108 reasons why you're the best that's the material intelligence but the spiritual intelligence is slightly different the spiritual intelligence is the intelligence which is going to help us always remind are uh, 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 as of our original identity along with the functional identity and this uh, is called this krishna calls this kind of a person as the sthita pratnya yes sthita pratnya so who has one pointed intelligence and there i think somebody did mention vyavsayatmika buddhi yes ek ek eh gunandan so uh, when you know you have this one pointed intelligence which is not branched here and there then you can do your functional duty perform your functional duties keeping always the original identity in mind yeah so arjuna's ne- next automatic question or the you know very uh, natural question is what are the qualities of this sthita pratnya does anybody remember what does he ask a very strange question he asks about the sthita pratnya does anybody remember how does he walk how out of this harshita mata ji it's ka bhasha kim prabhasit kim asit kim rajate how to walk how to speak how to sit what are the general symptoms of sense gratification right. right yes so very interestingly he asks uh, about sthita pratnya says how does he how is this person who has such one pointed intelligence how does he uh, walk how does he sit how does he speak how do we understand these questions is arjuna is asking about the sthita pratnya whose intelligence is fixed how does he conduct himself how does he uh, speak as in what is occupying a large portion of your heart that is what you will end up speaking yes gossip or if it's politics then politics that is what you will end up speaking that whatever is there mostly in your consciousness in your heart and then the other part of how does he sit is how does he control himself in terms of his senses how does he resist yes these are the questions that uh, arjuna is asking and then krishna goes on to describe and that's where we come to the verse of purmongani vasanshaya yes how the tortoise withdraws its senses so a lot of verses will go on describing an important point here when krishna uh, begins to talk about the qualities of sthita begins to talk about uh, how this person sthita prana focused in intelligence doesn't get disturbed either by happiness or distress similar to what we already discussed he keeps equanimity equipoised he talks a lot about this in the second chapter the underlying theme is that of tolerance much of tolerance and then he says even asthita pragna very very um, you know focused in his on his path may fall down may get distracted and there is where he speaks about this dangerous chain reaction which you all said yes dhyato vishayantam tam 
संगस्तेजायते संगा संजायते कामा कामा क्रोधो भी जायते वॉट इज इंग जस्ट हैव टू कंटेम्पलेट ऑन समथिंग दैट्स इन अफ too much contemplation on something then slowly what happens you want to associate and then when that happens dehay to sanga sangat sanjayate kama you get desire and then kama krodha when that desire doesn't get satisfied you get angry and when uh, you get angry krodhat bhavati sammoha you completely become bewildered and then sammoha smriti vibhrama Yes, you you forget everything. You forget what the goal of your life is, which means what you forget your original identity. That's the pity. We forget our original identity, and when that happens, everything is lost because you forgot you've lost your intelligence. Smriti Brahmasha, Buddhi Nasho, Buddhi Nasha, Pranashyati. This is the dangerous chain reaction that Krishna is mentioning, and which is why he focuses again on the two types of intelligence. when i said the underlying theme is tolerance the theme of tolerance or tolerance is possible when we understand our true identity right so i was giving an example uh, suppose you know a, a student is writing an exam and people are distracting if the student is very focused he knows very well that i have to complete then the student doesn't get distracted or if somebody is driving and wants to reach a destination and there is some uh, you know some disturbance on the road somebody stops somebody is fighting this person is not going to stop yell scream nothing he says okay go away i want to reach why because he knows or she knows where he or she has to go the the original identity if it is clear then we don't we don't get agitated we can remain tolerant and we will speak about this salient concept from this chapter how mind control is not the same as suppression does anybody have a question at this point or any comment okay so we'll um, talk about this concept a bit um, about uh, how most often we may assume that controlling mind is two things one is either denial of our emotions denial of our feelings or two suppressing them we just suppress them because we are devotees so we suppress them and we say that no no i can't get angry i'm a devotee or i can't have any of those negative emotions because i'm a devotee but what happens then they stay in the subconscious mind and they will come after sometime most definitely and uh, i was just sharing this with someone i heard that in ayurveda it is said that uh, parkinson's disease is because of anger being controlled and this i heard from some ayurvedic doctor i'm not too sure but makes sense yeah what make what sense does it make the more you control your emotions in that sense yes you deny them you suppress them then they may come out in terms of physiological problems as well later so how what does tolerance mean uh, is uh, is a bit um, you know it's kind of important and it's going to be discussed a little in brief here uh it said that the moment we become cognizant of our emotions yes cognizant of our emotions in the sense we bring our emotions our feelings into the conscious real yes into the in the paradigm of uh, consciousness that's the first step and then we begin to digest these emotions through spiritual intelligence yeah digesting these emotions through spiritual intelligence is very important and uh, uh, you know so what exactly it means to digest these emotions through spiritual intelligence is just similar to how you digest uh, you know food through the fire that's there in our stomach right if our dige- digesting capacity is not good it would it will obviously lead to certain health issues similarly here how do we digest our emotions through spiritual intelligence is uh, by actually first step like i said bringing our emotions to the conscious real acknowledging them accepting them and then sorting our uh, 
concepts that we have understood, philosophy that we have understood through our spiritual intelligence. So there are there is a lot of confusion there. Yes, we've heard this, we've heard that, so many things. We need to sort them out. We need to we need to see where this emotion is coming from. What exactly? Where can I? How can I actually uh, understand this relation? This this particular emotion from what, what is the source? The moment I begin to observe it and not get absorbed, so the two difference, yes, not, not absorbed in it, but observe that emotion, then I am in a position to take charge of it. Very difficult, but uh, that's the first step. And that I think all of us, we can uh, actually implement this you know, day to day. It's something which is very, very practical. We begin to observe ourselves and not get absorbed and see why this particular emotion is 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 is, is ruling our life, right? So that's the first step, the first way um, to uh, to develop our spiritual intelligence. And the second way is to follow certain rules. Uh, this is this is when we are actually conditioning our um, life or our mind to a certain set or certain um, you know certain routine what happens with developing spiritual intelligence so when there is something which we're not supposed to do but we still do the that conditioning that is there it will help us uh, to to kind of check that and that way we will tolerate Yes, so tolerance, an important theme of this particular chapter is through spiritual intelligence. And this is, uh, uh, this is how Krishna is uh, telling that when this happens, then you become like an ocean. Yeah, where uh, unlimited desires, even if they come in, you remain calm. Because now your spiritual intelligence has developed. Right? Anybody has any comments to make or some questions to ask? this point okay so mataji that um, so mostly uh, i think it's uh, we understand you just mentioned uh, we have to first understand the reason for all our emotions and then the verse 2.66 is more relevant in that uh, context uh, how to control and rather than suppressing um, focusing our mind intelligence everything on lord and engaging ourselves in the devotional service. So, S2.6 is, is uh, more relevant in yeah. what you have explained. Right. Yeah. Basically, the uh, highlight is uh, you know, tolerance through uh, sorting out our emotions on the basis of scriptures. Yes. That is why it is said Shastra Chakshu, isn't it? We develop that, uh, that idea to look at things from the perspective of the scriptures and not on the perspective of our emotions again. Yes, because our emotions are always ruling us in one way or the other. But if we are going to, you know, hoping to rise above them, then we'll have to look from the perspective of the scriptures. That is the first step. And the second step is to follow certain practices on a very regular basis that will also help us um, uh, tolerate. Yeah, and then we are not suppressing them we are actually digesting them. So it's not its not uh, true. We, we cannot deny those emotions. It's not right to do that. We'll have to accept, acknowledge it, but uh, we will have to get over them, right? And not pull ourselves out in a, in a way we injure ourselves, right? So those emotions are supposed to be digested. Okay. So now we come to the third chapter. Let's see if you can... What, what concepts do you think? Krishna took the charioteer position. Where? He's a servant of devotees. Okay, servant of devotees. Mm. All right. Something in the third chapter, Prabhuji? Rajesh Prabhu, you What, what does this picture probably, the, the one where he is washing Sudama's feet, uh, yeah, of course, it depicts humility, but it depicts something else also. Can, uh, in the context of third chapter, can we? Yeah. 
There are others, Ramya, Ishwar, Arpita, Deepesh. Dr. Sahana has joined. Thank you, Dr. Sahana. Yes, madam, I'm very new to it. I'm really getting good insight into it now. <laughs> yeah, you missed quite a when you, you just joined. So. Yeah. Okay, so uh, nobody else. Does uh, performing, performing your prescribed duties. Very nice. Thank you. That was Nikita. Yes. Nami Nami Perfect. Absolutely. Yes, he doesn't have any duty, but he's still doing this duty of respecting the Brahmana. Yes, such a such a deep point that Krishna is showing in this verse. Humility, all, all right, but also uh, he was his friend, but uh, he still did this as his duty. Okay, then what others or what others uh, concepts are there in this? No, this elephant and this <laughs> is, is kind of, um, and there are there is a hint also here. <laughs> Three letters of the word is coming out there. Servant. <laughs> okay, yeah, close to that. You're not, you're right. Taking shelter of Krishna. <laughs> okay, service taking shelter of Krishna, though he's. I don't know where is okay, uh, is taking shelter of Krishna, but there is this concept of sacrifice, isn't it? The third chapter is talking about sacrifice, which you can see in this particular picture. The elephant is holding the umbrella for his friend and not for himself. Okay, so that's sacrifice which Krishna talks about in this chapter. And this, the beautiful picture. Prasadam, Prasadam. That's right. That's right. It's a, it's about prasadam. How everybody is offering everything to Krishna. My servant. So sorry, yeah. I went ahead. Yeah. So Krishna, Krishna is in the center, and everybody is offering to Krishna. He's very keen on offering to Krishna. You can, see. right? Uh, all his friends. All right. We have more pictures now. This I think should be very very clear. It's less conquering list. Conquering um, strategy. Conquering conquering list. Less takes no, uh, strategic no. positions. Domain of Vriyate, Vatti, Adhada, Shomani. Okay. Yes. Uh, something more, more specific. I think the consciousness um, in human uh, beings, animals, and then the trees. Okay. Ramya Mataji said something which I missed. Yeah, lust concurrence. Um, fire, uh, smoke covering fire, uh -huh. uh, embryo covered by wound. Yeah. And uh, mirror uh, covered with smoke. Right. Right. What is all this? All the three pictures they're depicting what? Lust. Degrees of lust. Degree. Yeah. Degrees of lust. Oh, yeah. we have for human, uh, animals, and uh, trees. Right. 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 That's right. So the degrees to which we are covered. That's what is being uh, explained here, and we will see the third chapter begins with more confusion. Yes, and then all of these other uh, topics, which we will see one by one. So Arjuna doesn't seem to be satisfied. Yes, and the first verse he says, you're talking about intelligence and you're talking, asking me to fight? <laughs> what is this? You know, on the one side you're saying, you know, we develop your spiritual intelligence and on the other side you're asking me to engage in this ghastly war. What sense does it make? Arjuna begins with this and Krishna begins with saying that, Arjuna, nobody can stay without working. So you will have to work. But in what mood will you work? So it is in this chapter that Krishna is now beginning to establish his position. Right? Till now it was more of um, uh, an analytical study. Yeah, the soul, body, this, that, tolerance, everything he is talking about, emotions. This. But now he is going to establish his position. So he says, yeah, you have to work. But how will you work? Work as a sacrifice, correct? Yadnyarthat karmano anyatra, he says, right? Lokoyam karma bandhanaha, tadatham karma kaumteya mukta sangha samajara. So very clear, very nicely Krishna is saying work, but work as a sacrifice for me. You don't have to renounce your work. But what you have to renounce? Renounce, you develop 
the spirit of renunciation in general yes renounce the ego that you're investing in a work that i am doing it renounce that he says but don't renounce work you cannot renounce work see i'm also doing my work krishna is saying i'm also doing my work so he says you work he says if you don't uh, work with this spirit of sacrifice then arjuna you will incur sin yes and the famous verse comes here what is that famous verse where krishna is saying that you have to uh, those who do not offer with before eating they are very dikam vignesh tasya sarva king he says he says very clearly that you know everybody who eats anything first has to offer it to krishna with a sense of gratitude it makes only so much sense right otherwise we are thieves we are actually stealing that's what krishna brings out here very very nicely he brings out here that you you perform your duty because even all leaders are performing the duty and that's another very important verse that comes here uh, you know as to how the yad yad achare achare shreshtha yes how uh, the leader will perform the leader will do that's what the followers will do so it's important that you do your duty and if you don't do that then you are committing sin if you don't offer before you do anything to me then that's actually a sin and then arjuna asks a very important question he says that you know after knowing all this also it's it's hard why does one commit sin yes and that's when krishna answers what you all just uh, said and saw in the slide about how one acts helplessly depending on the covering and sometimes it's very very simple yes shanmuga prabhu line line yeah so sometimes it may be the covering may not be so difficult like the dust accumulated on a mirror just have to brush it yes once you do that then it becomes clear you can see as it is yeah what does it actually mean to be covered by uh, whatever last or whatever you know by it. it means that we can't see things as they are so that is the first uh, level which is not so difficult but what is very dif more difficult is the smoke and the fire you can't really see the fire if the smoke is too much right but the worst case is that of the embryo which is in the womb just helpless totally helpless so sometimes we become totally helpless because of that covering is so thick is so uh, defining that we can't get out of it even if we want to do something would i have heard of so many people but i want to get up i want to do but i can't do i want to do this i want to chant i want to read but it doesn't happen and we ourselves experience why take anybody else's example yes we keep struggling with these three faces three kinds of covering not that somebody is uh, you know stamped like this but we are all suffering these different layers of covering at every point in time sometimes it is so much sometimes it is so much yeah the dust sometimes it's uh, easy to wash it off one phone call from a devotee helps yes when when prabhuji calls for the morning japa program and we all say oh, yeah 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 we have to get up so that's easy sometimes it is so so dense the covering is uh, so dense that despite uh, 10 phone calls it doesn't really work yes whatever you keep sending messages and it doesn't work that's what it is but what is the salient uh, concept in this chapter and i hope i'm not oh i have really to speed up now so the salient uh, top concept from this chapter arjuna krishna is saying that i do my duty you also do your duty yes he's saying you also do it how without any expectations i am doing my duty you know you also do your duty without any expectations it's exactly like the french revolution queen you know if you, i don't know how many of you are low i often remember when when i read this mary antonet and what she said when when uh, the french revolution happened because all the peasants they came to the queen and they said we don't have anything to eat there's no bread so what did the queen say then eat cake if there is no bread eat cake she said yes she was so haughty arrogant is krishna saying like that no is krishna saying that you know i am doing my duty also do krishna has nothing to achieve 
Yes. So he can do anything without uh, expecting anything. But can we do that? How can we do that? Work without any expectation. That is a very difficult concept. And many a times, uh, you know, this verse in ch second chapter itself, Krishna is saying, Karmanyeva Dikaraste. Yes. Mahafaleshu Kadachana. He says this. And there is a focus of that in the third chapter. How does one work without any expectation? So, uh, for this, there's a very uh, interesting understanding of how to work from or uh, with the perspective of abundance, okay? mentality of abundance. So, there is there are two, those who are in the management uh, field, they know this pretty well, uh, the abundance mentality and the scarcity mentality. I think this is given by uh, one of the management people. I don't remember, Kobe or something, Robert Kobe or something. And uh, he says something like this, that you can work efficiently when you work from the abundance mentality framework. So let's see how we exactly apply this uh, in the Bhagavad Gita. It's so beautiful. When you can, how to work without expectations. How does one uh, achieve this abundance mentality? What does it mean? Stephen Covey, that is, that is the person who has just written that down. So what happens when we work with the abundance mentality is we are in a situation to give. We are in a situation to contribute. When we work from the scarcity mentality, then what are we doing? We are trying to get because we are scarce because we want to fill up something so with that mentality we can never work without expectations but when we have an abundance mentality what does it mean we want to give so we don't have any expectations right and this abundance mentality in spiritual life doesn't mean abundance in terms of our material possessions right mostly when we are you know, in the material world, when we have lots of wealth or whatever, what is our mentality? It's mostly that of exploitation. Yes, mostly that I have everything and uh, I just want to exploit the other because I'm so good. But that's not what this is talking about. The abundance mentality in spiritual life is having this feeling that I am abundant, I am full and I want to give. By giving, I'm not going to lose anything. Why? Because I am connected with abundance always. I am not working from the platform of scarcity where I need to keep getting and filling in my scarcity. Right? So this, this attitude, how do, does one develop? Very simple. By connecting ourselves with the source of all abundance, Krishna. Krishna is Purnam. Yes, Om Purna Midam Purna Madha Purna Purna Mudachate, which means what? Is Purna. From that Purna, you take out a Purna, also it still remains Purna. That's the beauty uh, of uh, now the Ishopanishad talks about uh, Krishna in that sense. It is full. So you connect with Krishna, then you are always abundant. You have a feeling of abundance, and then you want to give. Then you don't feel that I'm doing this. Now, what am I going to get? Now, I'm how much I will serve? How much will I do this? No. You're feeling abundant. You just keep want to keep giving. But the moment you turn away from Krishna, what happens? Krishna, if he goes away, then there is also an unlimited hole or a scarcity because Krishna is again unlimited. So you want to keep filling that unlimited scarcity. Because Krishna is out. So there is a bottomless pit that is formed in your heart. And then we see, oh, maybe this, or maybe career is going to help me. No, no, maybe relationship is going to help me. No, I think I should go on an outing. No, I must do this. I must, I must do that. So many things we want to do. Why? Because Krishna is not there. We are not working on the platform of abundance. Right? So this uh, uh, mentality of abundance is possible only when we remain connected with Krishna and uh, then uh, we can work without expectations just as what Krishna is asking us to do. Right? Anybody has any comment or a question at this point? Alright, so let's move on. This is the next chapter and
okay so then uh, in that sense let us uh, let us all uh, wait for questions if you all have any and uh, first three chapters that we have covered and uh, we should go a little in detail maybe i sh i don't know maybe i should have but uh, i'm not sure if anybody has a question at all mataji one question what ஒன்ஸ்ட்ரிசிட்டி is it the right way to say that naturally if we have that mentality of connecting with krishna so because he has everything in absolute abundance so if we have that attitude in that platform we will also be able to elevate to that level uh, i mean spiritually i mean to say i don't know whether i got your question right but uh, you are asking if we can uh, develop the same Uh, qualities as krishna no 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 you will not because krishna is swarat and then but why i am saying is that abundance reminds me that uh, krishna has all the appliances in absolute abundance but if his devotee work works keeping him as a center and uh, so he will never be scared of anything what is required at that time not he not like uh, abundance but yeah there are different ways to look at it of course one way is um, you know when you are saying this some i got the point that even if we have something lacking in terms of our material resources uh, then krishna is there to fill up that uh, resource yeah definitely but uh, what's more important uh, is that we never feel that uh, is a stumbling block you know just because i don't have a big fat salary i may not you know i cannot um, do devotional service so no? there is no such requirement correct and that's what krishna qualifies by saying you know patram pushpam phalam so yes we have you've heard of this verse very beautiful in the bhagavad gita that will come later in some of the chapters that uh, you can anyways uh, perform your devotional service you can always remain enthusiastic and that uh, i think uh, is more important than anything else you know no other no other uh, inhibition or lack of resources will ever make you uh, disheartened to perform devotional service yeah is there, yeah the the only thing that will act as a stumbling block will be turning away from krishna and that is when you are you are initiating the process of that hole creating that hole yes yeah so you will obviously then feel that no maybe i need this maybe i need that i don't know if i uh, if that is what you are asking that is my question Thank you. Deepesh Prabhu ji you were asking. Yeah Mataji so um, I think uh, my question is a bit related to what Shanmukh ji just asked as well. So uh, I think in the end of the second chapter you mentioned right like um, the desires or the wants that we all have uh, like you are an observer to the wants or the situation that you are in not absorbing the situation that you are in. and then at the end of third chapter we are discussing about renunciation or the uh, working without any expectation it's mm. sacrifice right mm. now i'm sure these two are connected in the and you know, because when you observe from outside what your wants are and then because more often than not we we work for to fulfill a want right so just trying to put if you can just put some perspective to both these points perhaps that will be helpful because you mentioned that use the intelligence of scriptures to understand how to solve uh, a situation that you are in by observing it not getting into absorb like like someone being in anxiety someone being in depression or tension because they're not absor- observing what they are in but they are in that situation because they're trying to fulfill a want and that's what they're working for so a bit confused on, on those two lines but, no correct you're right that uh, uh, on the one hand we observe we have certain uh, practically we have certain wants certain needs to be met and how does one resolve that um, just by connecting with krishna yes will that be resolved hmm. uh, 
So very important to understand that. Um, uh, let me tell you a story. <laughs> and also let me tell you another story after this. Okay. I'll tell you two stories. One, um, so there is this man who goes uh, uh, to, a, you know, on a, on the bank of a river, he's sitting and he is observing the beautiful uh, scenery in the river. And then he suddenly sees a creature in the river, a very strange creature. Doesn't have any limbs, nothing, nothing like, you know, just a lump of flesh, which is obviously a water creature, a fish. And uh, it's, it's, it's uh, swimming inside the water. And, and what it does, it keeps its mouth open. And the worm comes and falls right inside the mouth of this creature. And this man, apparently a devotee, he looks at it and he says, oh, look at this. This creature didn't have to do anything. Just opened its mouth and there Krishna took care of him. And he says, this is what I'm trying to tell everybody. You don't have to do anything. You just have to, you know, be there and Krishna will take care of you. And the man sat there and he said, now you will see, I'm not going to do anything. And Krishna will surely come. And he sat there and he sat there and he sat there. Yes, it was uh, a day and the next day and he's sitting there doing nothing, starving. And hoping that Krishna is going to come. He says, I'm a devotee. The thing is nothing. And he got something to eat and I'm a devotee and there's nothing that's coming to me. So then uh, uh, Krishna finally comes. And when he comes and he says, okay, get up, what? So this devotee says, it took you so long. You didn't see me starve for so many days. It took you, it took you so long to come. You didn't see me. And uh, Krishna said, if you look at this creature, in the river all it had was a mouth and it kept it, it its mouth open you you have hands legs intelligence everything why don't you use it right so very important idea to understand is krishna is talking about duty he's not saying not to perform your duty right so if we have a certain want we need to perform our duty properly and satisfy those wants, but in connection with Krishna or keeping Krishna in the center, all the time giving credit to him and obviously acknowledging that it's because of him that I have this ability. Correct? And then right. there, there is not much of a, then you won't be so confused as to what to do. But the moment you say that, well, I don't know, I, I'm okay, I'm, I don't have to do anything, then problems will be. So the correct understanding of performing your duty, which is why Krishna is saying that, uh, telling Arjuna, Arjuna is saying that I want to go and beg. Yes, he says, Kim no Rajena Govinda, Kim Bhoga Jeevite Nama, where he renounced, he says, what is the use of all this kingdom Govinda? What am I going to do with all this enjoyment? Let me go and become a beggar in Himalayas. What does Krishna say? Fight your Kshatriya, you'll go there and fight with someone else. Because that's your duty. Yes, you go and fight there, better you fight here, when I'm asking you to fight here. Right. That's the uh, that's the one bit of... Uh, does that satisfy you? Yes, yes, yes. And the other bit of uh, what Shanmukha Prabhu was also saying, that how to develop this abundance. And I said that developing this abundance mentality, the crucial way is to listen, hear. And what do we hear? We hear of the beautiful... Uh, pastimes of Krishna. We, we listen to all of uh, uh, the stories, also the philosophy, but more than philosophy, what is appealing is the beautiful pastimes. The more we hear, the more we develop this abundance mentality. Yeah? So, you know, I heard this very beautiful pastime, so I thought I must share this with all of you. So we all develop our abundance uh, mentality. Yes, uh, this uh, is, let's go back to Gokul and uh, we have little Krishna very small and running around everywhere. Mother Ishoda is uh, preparing for some puja and uh, she has cleaned up the house, all that. And she tells her little Krishna, he says, she says, Kanha, go bring the little calf for puja. Uh, we bring the best calf from the Goshala, bring her here. I want to keep her ready for this puja. Little Kanha, you know, maybe around three years old. Then children are really, really cute at that age. Uh, starts running towards the Goshala and uh, there he sees all the cars and he spots one beautiful white color calf and he runs towards her. Now this calf is very naughty 
and she starts chasing you know she starts running away from krishna and krishna is chasing that cow so for a long time krishna is say hey, you know hansi wait wait and hansi is just running and running and then finally he catches hold of her and he says come maya is calling let's go so catches hansi and then starts walking towards uh, mother ashoda and then when he is walking back on his way is just walking towards where yashoda mai is waiting for the puja he looks around he looks to the side and he sees this room full of butter <laughs> it is very difficult to now resist butter is nicely tied up uh, kept freshly churned butter so he says okay now no friends are there but i need butter how do we do so he takes hamsi along drags her inside and he says come you help me now and the butter is tied up there you know all the on the ceiling so what does kanha do kanha says hansi stand here i am going to climb on you and i am going to take this butter yes so hansi is already very restless but manages to stand because krishna is holding her very tight little gopal and gopal stands on hansi and tries to dig into the pot of butter it's it's uh, you know at a height but manages to hold the pot and uh, hangs himself on the pot and digs his hand into the butter and is about to put the butter into his mouth when hamsi from below runs away <laughs> yes he is standing on hamsi and hamsi from below she runs away and now gopal is left hanging there what does he do he calls out to his mother yes maya he says now what and, and till then he was all on the sly but now he needs help and his mother she comes looking for gopal where he is and then he sees red handed she catches him stealing butter yes how holding and he still says no i don't know how i came in here that's gopal he says he says i this hamsi he's trying to blame hamsi is he's, he's trying to blame every other person but not himself and then mother ashoda she brings him down yes and she says that i feed you so much butter but still you want to steal from your own house this is krishna these are the sweet past times with which we can fill uh, our abundance mentality as yes, there are so many like this so what shanmuga prabhu asked that how can we feel that abundance that abundance will come only when you connect with this abundance with this feeling um, that i uh, don't really need much i need whatever i need i will work towards it but uh, i will uh, work with krishna in the center for krishna for to please krishna yes so we will we will wind up then if nobody else has any other question if you have any other question you can ask mata ji i have one question yes yes yeah uh, first of all thank you so much it was very insightful it was very pleasant hearing you all all time uh, so any practical tips mata ji on uh, digesting emotions uh, against uh, absorbing emotions mm. Yeah, I'm also learning. <laughs> so it's a continuous process. It's really a continuous process, and uh, I think Krishna gives a very practical tip also in the in another context, but which is very very relevant. Abhyasa ena tu and vairagya ena yes. That is cut by practicing on a very regular basis and remaining detached. How in the sense of an observer. so if you don't have to get absorbed in something then we have to train our mind to become an observer this is so important right we observe our own feelings we observe how um, situations are not judging anything but we are observing completely coming out and observing our own mind and that is possible when we are associate with the devotees yes we keep hearing about this we are reminded Uh, all the time of uh, that is why we do this analytical study yeah what is analytical study that you know we are not this body you know we have this mind intelligence false ego so we look at the gross body subtle body senses all this why do we need only for this so we can actually become neutral yeah otherwise uh, it's may it may be hard for us to uh, practice uh, you know the connecting with krishna through hearing krishna's past times they may become only um, just sentimental involvement yeah but when we look at it uh, from the analytical perspective like this 
uh, then it makes a lot more sense. Then it, it, it makes it possible for us to observe ourselves and to observe things around us, not to get involved. So I heard also this example of how, um, you know, when, watches, when one watches a movie, yeah, you can also get completely involved in it and uh, cry your heart out. Yeah, we can see now I've heard so many people crying when they see Kashmir files or whatever. What? So th there is a possibility that you get so much involved into that. Yeah, but you don't want to get into that situation, right? In the sense that you, do, if, if somebody offers you, you can also be a part of this movie in the sense in reality. You don't want to be a part of it. You want to observe that movie from outside. And that's how we have to observe ourselves also. And, and it's easier said than done, definitely. Like I said, I'm also practicing. Uh, it's a practice to continuously observe ourselves without getting absorbed. And that is only possible. There is no magic. Uh, the only possibility is association, association with devotees and association with uh, uh, Bhagavad Gita or Srimad Bhagavad Gita. Yes, Harshad Prabhu? Does that Thank you, Thank you, Hare Krishna. If anybody else wants to ask. Okay. If not, like we will, I will coordinate with Masaji uh, to see how uh, and when we can have her next to continue with summary and revision of the other three chapters, four, fifth, and six. And Masaji was really insightful, like uh, summarizing the six chapters in one and a half hours is, is really difficult. But what you did for the first three chapters, bringing important points uh highlighting you know through pictures you know what all is covered in the chapter is what you know again a very nice way uh, and that you know helps us to memorize through pictures you know what is there in the chapter that's very helpful so i would like to thank you very much and thanks all the participants uh with this we'd like to uh, stop the recording here